But please open your Bibles to uh, what I consider to be the most practical passage of scripture in the Bible for keeping my personal life on track with the Lord. Uh, I don't know about you, but there are so many voices and sounds and pictures and events and texts and tweets and you know updates and in case you miss this is that, that life gets so full, it's hard sometimes to keep up with all the dimensions of life. And the one we want to make sure is always well cared for is our spiritual life. And so in this passage, and we're in Matthew 6 right here, and as you turn there, what we're looking at is not a prayer to be recited, although there's nothing wrong with reciting it. When we recite the Lord's Prayer, it's like we're all repeating scripture we've memorized. But this passage of scripture contains what I believe is the most complete checklist of what God wants us to make sure we're maintaining in our lives. Now, we're on the second petition. There are seven petitions. I'll point those out pretty soon. The second one is when Jesus instructed us that we're supposed to say in our prayers something along the lines of thy kingdom come. It's the shortest of all the petitions, but Martin Luther said 500 years ago, it's the terrible petition. Because it's an invitation to the God of the universe inviting him to control me. That's what we're saying when we say thy kingdom come. He's the king, it's his kingdom, and we're inviting his kingdom to come and, and because we're praying it into our lives. And so what we're learning is uh, this, this prayer is, is a guide, it's a pattern, it's a collection of petitions that are to frame for us what are the vital aspects that need constant maintenance for us to be pleasing and fruitful and doing everything the Lord wants us to do. So control me is how we learn to seek because it's a choice. We don't have to do this. We don't have to invite this. We don't have to welcome. We don't have to surrender. It's, it's a choice to seek. And then this is very interesting. First, if you look at the way the prayer is structured, uh, you know, our Father which art in heaven, it starts out with just focusing on who God is. The very first real, I mean, after we, we address the letter, the content of the letter starts with this, thy kingdom come. It's the first priority that Jesus mentions in chapter six, verse 33, the same right where you are, Matthew six thirty-three says, seek ye first. Now let me give you a Greek word study. Do you know what the Greek word first means? First. Isn't that amazing? It means first, priority, ahead of everything else, at the top of the list, most important, what I attend to first. What does the Lord say as soon as you go online and make sure that you're, you're actually connected and online? What's the first petition that you offer to God. God, more than anything else, I need you to control me. I want to seek first your rule, that's what kingdom is, over my life, and if this is supposed to be the manner we pray and we're supposed to pray without ceasing, it's not like once a week I need to kind of say, okay God, it's time for you to take over again, I've kind of gotten a ditch a lot this week and I've had several breakdowns, it's time for you to take over again. It is a constant desire we have to seek first the rule of God over my life every day. Now, I, I am from the generation that lived through the, uh, the, all the space shots. I remember distinctly, you know, Alan Shepard and John Glenn and the Mercury flights and then, and then the Gemini flights, you know, the, the, the two, first it was one astronaut, then it was two, then Apollo was three. And, and I remember America was a lot less intense back then. And so, it seemed like forever the camera would be on that countdown for the blast off and it would show the big tall rocket and the steam coming out of it and there'd be a little counter at the bottom and you would hear the sounds of, this is Houston, you know, we're checking this, we're checking. And there was this checklist, this sequence, a launch sequence. Before it blasted off, there was a sequence. If you ever ride an airplane, whether it's a private plane or a commercial plane, if on the way in as you're ducking, you know, if you're in one of the little ones, you're ducking to come in the doorway and trying to hold all your stuff and the stewardess is standing there, if you look to your left, you can usually see right in there where the pilot 
and the navigator and whoever else, however big the plane is. is. And if you look at them, they have all these uh, papers and they have clipboards and they're, they're dialing things and they're checking and they're tuning up. But they're going through a sequence before that plane launches. You know what the Lord says? He says, I've left you. Now I want you to think about, sometimes you know, we just jump into the text without thinking, where are we jumping? Who gave us Matthew 6, 9 to 13 that's in front of you? Jesus Christ himself. Jesus commanded. He said, after this manner, therefore, verse 9, pray ye. And that's an imperative. So this list comes from as high as it can get. And Jesus didn't say, repeat these words. He says, follow this pattern. In this manner, after this, this framework, what it is is it's, it's a spiritual checklist. And it comes from Jesus Christ himself. And what he said is, if you're going to be my disciples and make it through life and blast off into your day, before you take off, make sure all of these systems are operating. You know, they, did you see the amazing picture of the taxi cab and the, I think it was Taiwan, and a gigantic commercial airplane was flying sideways and it clipped its wing across the bridge in front of the taxi cab. Boy, that must have uh, raised their blood pressure uh, a lot if you saw that. And do you know what they found out? In the excitement of the moment, the fella flipped the wrong switch. Boy, they better follow that checklist or, you know? We... That, to me, is a picture of how a lot of Christians are going through life. They are not prayerfully, daily following the checklist that the Lord gave. So what, what exactly are we talking about? Well, I'm going to go through these with you. You look at your Bibles and you think. We've already covered this first one, but it's, it's seven elements that Jesus gives. And basically... Much like a pilot goes over his checklist before takeoff of every flight, just to make sure they've done everything needed for a safe flight, so we as followers of Christ need to take a moment to make sure we're ready to fly through the storms of life. And so instead of us all designing our own and trying to figure out and say, boy, mine's a little better than yours, Jesus said, after this manner, this is your pre-flight checklist to make sure that you're gonna head the right direction, have a good flight through your day. And here are the seven areas Jesus left for us to check, and they can be expressed as a prayer, series of prayer requests. They can be expressed as things we're asking God to conform us to. And the first one is, we're asking God to focus us. That's why this whole prayer starts with, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I need in my my rapid life to stop everything and focus. Did you know it's transformational to focus on who we're talking to? And God says, focus on me. And this is when I, focus me is my request to God when I pause and reaffirm that God is my father. Now, if you know anything about world uh, generational history of monarchies, you know the Windsor name, right? You all know the Windsor name. That's the ruling family in England, their last name. Do you ever wonder what Prince Charles' last name is? It's Windsor. And that family name, if you're attached to it, you're attached to billions of dollars. Now, you know, sometimes they talk about how expensive everything is, but, I mean, they have estates that measure 60,000 acres. I mean, that's, that is thousands of square miles. I mean, we're talking about wealth because of a name. Well, I mean, that's nice, a few billion. Look who our father is. He is the all-powerful, always loving, all-knowing, always present owner of the universe. I mean, think, when you focus on that, saying, you know, I don't have enough money for my bills, and my car is broken down again, and I'm sick, and the Lord says, okay, all those are true, pause and look up. And focus for a minute on the one who actually stood at your birth, actually helped your folks meet each other, actually designed your DNA, and, and genetically modified you to the exact person you are today, and pause and look at him for a minute and realize 
that he knows everything, the end from the beginning. And he's totally in control. And all he wants you to do is conform your world to responding his way to your situation. Because, see, he is watching over and guiding and directing and bringing to pass, and prayer is for me to harmonize with him and say, you know what, you know more than I do, and you know better than I do, and you know more clearly than I do. Focus me on who is running everything. See, that's the start of prayer. We have to ask him to focus our hearts, our minds, our emotions, our responses to whatever is coming to us today through this truth that he is the almighty God of the universe and he's sitting on the throne of heaven and he's my father. And that leads us to the second one. And the second one is that, and by the way, the, the, there's something inherent in this uh, when it says our father the only way that you can have God as your father is to be born into his family. Uh, that's salvation. It's not by association. It's not by uh, generational. Well, my parents were Christians, so I am. It's not cultural. I live in a Christian nation. It's as dramatic as your birth. And your birth is dramatic. You go from you know, being a water breather to being an air breather. And you go from having all that, that stuff. I mean, I've been at so many births, you know, of, of that myconium and everything. And all of a sudden you're out here with us and it's very traumatic. And the new birth is very traumatic. It's very much a change of our entire operating system that God becomes our father. And we have to, everything goes back to that. That we have a whole new paradigm. We were born the first time, our first traumatic birth. We were of our father, the devil. The new birth, the regenerating born again experience changed our families permanently. And we need to keep focusing on that because there's a part of us that wants to go back to the old father, the old system, the old way of focusing on ourself and focusing and, and living for ourself and measuring everything around how it attaches to me rather than how everything is to focus on God and it's all about him. But when we do that, the very first petition after the new birth, after knowing who we belong to, after knowing we're saved, after knowing God is our father, the very first petition is the terrible one, I want you to control my life. And if you think about the controlling, and this is when I consciously surrender to God, this is when I invite him to take over my life again. By the way, how often are we supposed to pray? Paul said, pray without what? This is interesting, because this is the only endless part of our Christian life that's commanded, which is prayer. And prayer starts with inviting God's control before we tumble out with all of our problems and kind of updating God on everything that we're going through and all of the, everything that he's kind of slack on and everything else, we, we look at him and we invite him to control us. That's, that's the checklist Jesus gave. I mean, start thinking in your mind. Are, are you and I set to do this? Do we pause be still and know who we're talking to and just let that settle in. And then we bow in front of him and invite his control. Did you know that solves about 95% of all the things we come to him with, if you think about it. And when we invite his control, we offer him the priority spot in our life. We say, I want you to control the first place in my plans. I want to seek you before everything else. I want to seek your word to feed my soul because that's what you told me you want to do. I want to seek your truth to guide my thoughts because I don't want to think error. I want to seek your peace because that's the only thing that can guard my anxious heart. I want to seek you right here before I fly out into my day. See, I, I was riding with someone. There's a, a fellow in the church, a good friend of mine. 
when I first got here six, seven years ago. He says, hey, do you want to go out for a $100 hamburger? And I thought, a $100 hamburger? I mean, who would pay a, I don't really, I'm not a big hamburger nista, and who would pay $100 for one of those? And he says, just come and humor me, and I did. And so we, I found out what the $100 was, it was the gas. We flew to a hamburger place. And so we get into his plane and, and he's, I mean, have you ever been in one of those little planes and they're just revving this, it's almost jumping until he's sure everything works and then he lets off the brake and we take off and we have our $100 hamburger. Now, what I saw was that plane was totally under control and that engine, I mean, it was just rattling the whole thing, but until he took that brake off, it didn't go anywhere. And the Lord says, you know what? Until you allow me to be the controller flying your life, you're not really going anywhere. You're vibrating and rattling and bouncing around and it's really loud. But until you surrender the control, you're going nowhere. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, once we get the control established, Lord talks to us about how we're going to go through life, and that's the next petition, to guide me. I mean, you're in charge. That's the ownership. But you're also the guide. You know what it says in Psalm 1611, you will show me the path of life. The way you know you're always following the Lord's will is if you're right behind the Lord following him. Not ahead of him. And not dug in and resistant, you know, kind of like the dogs that don't want to go for a walk, and they're just being dragged. You ever see that? They drag them down the sidewalk. That's a lot of Christians. And they're just, their little collar is just going like that. And no, we say, you're the master, guide me. Take me through life. That, that's what this, thy will be done is. This is my setting for every day. Every time I face a choice, I pause. I invite God to guide me. I invite him to lead me. I invite him to show me what will please you. This is all about staying in step with the Spirit. This is asking to be filled so I never pedal through life with flat tires. Do you remember that, that whole metaphor, picture, mental picture I gave you of the people pedaling through life on the bike race with flat tires? This is the guiding. When we say, guide me, he fills us with the Spirit and we can go the way we were designed to be. But we have to first look at who the guide is, surrender to his control, and then invite his guidance. And when we do that, then we start asking him to supply us. This transforms all of our personal prayer requests into a request from our Father for what is best. You know what this supply me element, which in the Lord's Prayer, this is our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, give us this day our daily bread. Do you know what that's an acknowledgement of? I only want him to give me what he knows is best and what he wants me to have. There's a whole segment of Christendom that falsely, erroneously, almost blasphemously tells God what to do. They, there's actually part of the vocabulary, I command you to do this or that because you have to. And it's like, who are you talking to? You didn't pause to focus and bow to his control. We are not commanding God. He commands us. And we ask him to supply. We don't tell him, I've looked it over, there's seven choices, that's the best one, get it for me. That's not prayer. Prayer is saying, supply me what you know is best in your perfect time. In fact, you want to know something interesting uh, about uh, one of the, the biggest words in the Hebrew language is translated into English, wait. There are not one Hebrew words, not two different Hebrew words, not three different Hebrew words, not four, not five, not six, not seven. There are eight completely different Hebrew words translated in your Bible you're holding in your lap this morning by one English word, wait. Do you know what that means? If you don't know anything else about Hebrew, God is big into making us wait. And there are all kinds of to wait prayerfully, to wait patiently, to wait quietly, to wait hopefully, to wait all kinds of ways. But they all have that awful attachment, wait. But you know what? 
growing up, you probably heard the little saying that God leaves the very best to those that leave the choice to him. And God will give us what's best when we let him pick and give. And that's what this whole supply me is all about. It transforms everything. My father is never late. He's rarely early. He's always on time. He wants me to increase in my faith. He wants me to ask. He wants me to keep asked by seeking. And he wants me to ask in faith by knocking and waiting. And while I'm waiting, he wants me to do something. He wants to cleanse me because guess what? Everything screeches to a halt. All of this, when, when I get saved and he becomes my father, his spirit moves within me. His spirit wants to control me and fill me and guide me and supply me. But if I do not keep short accounts with the Lord, everything screeches to a halt right here. This, this, this is the blockade right here. If I grieve the spirit that regenerated me, that controls and fills and supplies me, if I grieve him, it all halts. And, and what I have to do is I have to remember that I'm supposed to be constantly confessing my sins. He's faithful and just already once to have forgiven me, but if I don't have the benefit of his cleansing, it's, it's just futile. We try and try and everything amounts to just nothing. Because we, we do not, for, remember, you know, Matthew 18, by the way, all these, we're right here, we're gonna spend an hour on error, 45 minutes on each one, so I'll tell you then. But in Matthew 18, Jesus said, if you don't forgive others their trespasses, I will torment your life. Read Matthew 18. Jesus told the disciples, after he tells the story of the unforgiving servant, he looked at them. He stops the story and he looks at them and he says, so will your heavenly, fa your heavenly father do to you if every one of you from your heart doesn't forgive everyone of their trespasses against you. That cleansing halts everything. And so we do a quick inventory to see if there are any unconfessed, unforsaken sins in our life at this element of prayer. We apply God's call for me to be kind and tenderhearted. We say, God, I want to be forgiving everyone around me like you've forgiven me. And if there's anyone I'm holding a hurt or a grudge or an unforgiving spirit toward, I cry for cleansing because there's constant torment for me from my father if I won't. As long as I cling to my hurts, as long as I cling to my bitterness, as long as I'm unforgiving, the Lord says, I, if you regard iniquity in your heart, the Lord said, I'm not going to hear you. I'm, I'm shutting off the, the communication and the resupply because I don't want you to persist in that way. And that leads us after we get cleansed to say, Lord, I want you to protect me. I want to, it, it, this, this whole protect me has to do with our spiritual armor. Uh, Lord, I'm not gonna go out into life without wearing my helmet. I mean, I just saw a, an article about the uh, ratings of football helmets. Did you know there's good ones and bad ones? And a higher percentage of people have brain injuries in football games with this kind than this kind. And, and they were just analyzing it all and looking at all the people that have been injured and everything else. And can you imagine not wearing one of those things and charging around, banging into everything? Yet the Lord says he wants to protect us, but he gave us this, this wardrobe we're supposed to wear to make it through life. The helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, and putting on the belt of truth. He says, if you don't hold everything on with the belt of truth, it'll all fall apart. Ask our news commentator guy, right? You know, the one that, that was shot down or whatever, and now he says, well, I wasn't really shot down. I was, storm I was sanded down, you know? And, and now his whole life is falling apart because they're looking back and saying, you haven't been truthful. Now, I don't know why they're picking on him because a lot higher people are not truthful, but they just picked him as a target, I guess. I don't know, maybe someone doesn't like him. Uh, bad ratings or something, but protect me. This is my pause for checking my gear, my helmet that I'm holding on to the truth of salvation, my breastplate maintaining personal integrity and denying ungodliness, and on and on I could go. And after we have that protection, this is interesting, and... and um, this last petition, the seventh petition, and last week when I, or two weeks ago, I think when I was teaching on this, 
I was talking about, I said, now all of you say the Lord's Prayer with me. And in the visitor line, someone came and they said, my Bible doesn't have thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Why did you make us say that? And I said, I'll explain that in church. So I'll explain it. Here's the 32nd of why some people's Bibles uh, don't have that. And, and basically, the 32nd version would be this. There are 25,000 manuscripts. That's what MSS means. So the New Testament, not the Old Testament, the New Testament is 25,000. And if you put them all on tables, you would find that they come from two distinct regions of the world. They come from the East, which would be like Syria, Egypt, all that area, or they come from the West, which would be uh, where our uh, global partner we introduced this morning is from. Actually, they're called Byzantine. That's Byzantium. That's in modern-day Asia Minor. Uh, these are called, this is called the, the minority text because there's there are fewer words and fewer of them. This is also called the Eastern text. This is also called the critical text. Uh, this text was not really, really codified uh, until about the 19th century, 1881 actually, when it was finalized. This, the Byzantine, is called the majority. Uh, in fact, the majority of all these, uh, uh, upwards of um, um, close to 80% are this kind, B Byzantine majority. Uh, uh, this is, this is um, they have more words is the bottom line, and they're newer. These have fewer words, and they're older. Okay, so there's your snapshot. How about the Lord's Prayer? Well, when you examine every sermon from the second century onward, you find that thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory is in those sermons of all the pastors that taught through this from the second century on. But they're in the sermons, but they're not in these manuscripts that are from the Eastern church that are older, shorter, fewer. And so, what do we do about that? Well, we have, we have a Bible, and here's the words, and with the minority or Eastern text, here are the verses, and then they have a footnote, and they have down there, that is not in the oldest text. And they'll probably put it down there, but they put it in the footnotes. The, the Byzantine or the Western or the majority text, they just put it in because it's in these manuscripts. And they'll put at the bottom, some of the older manuscripts don't have this, but it was in the majority and in, you know, for the last 1,800 years in all the, the Bibles. This is the NIV, this is the NAS, this is the ESV. They follow the Eastern minority texts that are older and shorter. This is uh, the majority text, the King James, the New King James uh, majority text. What's the difference between them? Only one difference. Here, all the words are up here. Here, most of the words are up here and some of them are down there in the italics or in the center column or whatever. But it's the very same. I mean, you have the Bible in both places. You just have it in two spots here and in one spot there. And personally, after studying church history so long, I personally like the one where it's up in the text because it's reflected in over 80% of all the sermons ever preached in any church that's recorded had it in there. So that's why we have this seventh one. Let's, let me go back to it so I can talk about it. It's right there. And this one, I think, is so vital. This last one, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, is so vital because what it's saying is, it's not about me. Yours is the kingdom. You're the one that's running life. Yours is the power. It's not how much I can do on my own. Yours is the glory forever. I want you to empty me so that you can fill me. And this empty me petition is my conscious time of checking for something. You ever go hunting or hiking 
and you get ticks. Ticks are awful. They're so little, you, sometimes you don't see them. Did you know what this petition is? It's saying, Lord, I'm going to check myself that the little creeping ticks of pride do not start attaching to my life. How do you know when pride gets there? How the ticks of pride creep in unnoticed as I go through the woods and fields of life? Well, they start biting me and saying, I'm important. I'm vital. My way is to be fought for. My pleasures and conveniences are more important than serving God. There are a lot of ticks loose nowadays because people don't think that it's all about God. And we need to consciously, before we take off in life, say, Lord, I want to empty of what the world is infecting me with, that I'm living here for my purposes and my goals and I'm one of my emotions are gonna be tied to how I feel, not about your truth and not about your plan and it's not about me emptying myself and filling myself with you. That's what pride wants me to do. It wants me to zero out God's influence in my life. Well, let's get through this. This prayer actually is an overview of the essentials of my salvation. Uh, that's why I think it's so practical. At salvation, I was born into God's family so I can call him my father. When I surrender to God every day, I can say, Lord, your kingdom can come into my life. Whatever you bring, I want. When I present myself back to God as a servant, I say, Lord, I want your will. As, as you show me everything, the options in life, I want your will. And when I realize I don't live or move or have my being apart from God's provision, I can say, give me today what I need for today. And I stop spending my life trying to pile up stuff forever. I'm living day to day, trusting in his care. And then when I remember my dying savior hoarsely crying from the cross, do you remember what one of his words from the cross was? Father, forgive them. When I hear that, I say, I want to be kind and tenderhearted and forgiving. So forgive me my trespasses, Savior, as I forgive everybody who trespasses against me. See, that's, that, that's the killer for bitterness. We can't be embittered against anybody unless we want God to be tormenting us. When I understand that I've been set free, whom the Son will set free, I say, Lord, protect me from the evil one. And when I echo my Savior, do you remember what Jesus said on the way of the cross? He's down we are crying out, Hebrews says, loud cries. He's sweating, as it were, great drops of blood. And he said, Father, if you want to take away this cup from me, take it away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He said, Father, it's not, I came to do your will. I came to, to do your plan, not my own. And I say, echoing my Savior, empty me of anything but your plan. Well, when that happens, I realize Jesus said salvation equals God being the king of my life. And if you take your Bibles, I'm going to do a rapid fire Bible study with you before we define this. Look at Matthew 4. And, and what we're looking at, turn to Matthew 4, you're in 6, back up. Remember that salvation that Jesus presented is sometimes different than what you hear nowadays. And so it's always good to go back to the original and see what he presented. And Jesus, when, when Jesus presented the gospel, salvation, people getting saved, he said salvation equals entering the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is God is the king of this kingdom. And when you enter it, that means he's your king. Jesus equated salvation as going from the kingdom of darkness and the devil and as Paul put it, being transferred into the kingdom of his dear son. So let's look at this, Matthew 4, 17. This is Jesus' first public words. First time he, microphone catches him and he's talking in public and he says, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What is that? What are you saying for us to do? Well, slip down to verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus connected the gospel with entering the kingdom. And the, the kingdom means God is my king. The people that will bow, repent, 
humbly come before, in fact, look at chapter three. I mean, I mean, chapter five, it says the same thing. The people who will come to the king and say, I'm a beggar, I'm poor in spirit, they get to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's 5.3. In 5.10, they, they get persecuted because of this righteous life that God is bringing about in them, but they're possessors of the kingdom of heaven. They're saved. They're under God's rule. Go to verses 19 and 20. Uh, Jesus goes on to say, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and Pharisees, you won't even enter the kingdom of heaven. So there are people that enter it and people that don't. And the people that enter it have a righteousness that exceeds the most religious people of the day, scribes and Pharisees. How do they enter? They grieve over their sinfulness and they cry, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You're the king, you're the savior, you're the provider, you're the king of the universe, and I am not, and I bow to you. And what happens to them? We'll look at Matthew 6, verse 33. This is, this is the, what a Christian looks like. But seek ye first, there's that word again, first. Jesus said, you've left your first love. In fact, next time we get together, we're going to see, did you know, you want to know something interesting? I know you won't be able to sleep now that I tell you this. The seven petitions of the Lord's Prayer parallel what Jesus saw in the seven churches in Revelation. Did you know that? Did you know that what they didn't check before they flew through life shows up as what he condemns in the seven churches? Because you know what? They didn't need to do their pre-flight check and make sure they were in tune with the Lord. And they didn't need to seek first the kingdom of God. So you know what happened to them? Jesus said, you've left your first love. I'm not first anymore in your life. And you're doing everything, but you don't honor me above everything else. John 10, and if you keep going, I mean, you can... These are common verses that you all know. He who loves his father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Verse 38, who doesn't take up his cross. If you find your life, you lose it. Verse 39, but if you lose it for my sake, you find it. Do you see what Jesus is saying? He's saying there's a whole new paradigm you operate on. In Luke, he, he, if you go over to Luke chapter nine, he really uh, nails them. He says in verse 23, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. You want to you wanna be one of my followers, one of my disciples, one of those that's in my kingdom? Do you want to be saved? You got to deny yourself. You have to renounce your ability to save yourself. You got to say, I'm hopeless, I'm helpless, I'm lost. I need you. I can't make it without you. That's, that the ABCs of salvation is, the first is acknowledging my lostness and helplessness and hopelessness. And Jesus said, that's the, that's the doorway. And then he says, whoever, verse 24, desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life, that's the exchange life. That's where I say, it isn't even my life anymore, it's yours. How do you want to live my life? Because it's not mine, it's yours. You bought me at a price. Then we get to chapter 14, and, and look what Jesus says in Luke 14, verse 26. In there, he says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters in his own life also, he can't be my disciple. You say, hate? Yeah. What does that mean? Yeah, some of you say, yeah, that is what my husband or children or wife are like. They hate me. And we're not talking about that. We're talking about a love that is so supreme that it almost looks like we don't have any love for others because his is so complete. That's what, that's what it means to be a Christian. I love God more than myself or anyone else. And keep reading what he says in verse 27. Whoever doesn't bear his cross can't be my disciple. And then verse 33, whoever of you of chapter 14 that doesn't forsake all that he has can't be my disciple. All these are saying the same thing. I'm entering a kingdom, I get a new king, and he's in charge. So what does that mean? We need to seek God's control daily. That's the first request, petition. After we focus on who we're talking to, we say, your kingdom come in my life. And, and what does that look like when we get his rule? The petition control me, thy kingdom come, means this. And I'm just gonna run through this where we're gonna pick up Lord willing next week. Go back to Matthew 6. 
Now remember context, let's not conjure this up. These people are listening to Jesus talk. He has just told them how they're supposed to pray. And look what the next lesson is in chapter six, verse 19. If we're truly saying, Lord, I want you to control my life, control me, Jesus said, well, then this is what I'm gonna have to control in your life. Verse 19 of chapter six of Matthew. Therefore, in verse 19, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. You know, that word lay up in Greek, thesorizo, in English, thesaurus. What's a thesaurus? It's a book of stacked words. I read something interesting over the weekend. Uh, in, in Bloomberg, it talked about this unique man in Germany. He's a very big industrialist. He's earned $161 million. I wonder if any of us have, you know? Uh, but he's converted all his to gold. And he has a vault in the Bundesbank or whatever, you know, downtown Berlin or wherever it is. And he's rented this secure location and he has all 161 million in gold ingots. You know, they're like bricks, only they weigh 27 pounds each. And once a year, the bank has to let him in and all the security and the machine guns and he has a clipboard and he picks up his ingots and he <laughs> and carries them to the other side of the room, counting them. He wants to make sure they're all there. And the rest of the time, they're all locked up in that vault. You know, I was thinking, look, look what it says there. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But instead of wasting your time putting all your stuff in that vault in Berlin, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven because you aren't gonna have to count it every year and worry someone stole some of it. But what's the bottom line, verse 21, where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. Do you know what I, after I read that article, you know what I thought? In a few years, or maybe a few months, this guy's gonna get sick, and an ambulance is gonna come, and they're gonna take the elevator down, and they're gonna wheel him in in his gurney, and he's gonna be laying down there with one hand on that pile of gold. That's his treasure. And it's gonna be very hard for him to die, because he can't take it with him. Do you ever think about how hard it is to die if everything that's important to you is right here and you haven't transferred the ownership deed and title deed and said, it, it, I'm not even my own, my life is not my own, my treasures are not my own. I was bought at a price and I want to invest everything I have. Whether therefore I eat or drink, whatever I do, I want to do it to your glory. Well, I'll give you a preview of next week. If I say control me, I'm saying now I control my treasures, control my body. I want to present myself as a living sacrifice. I say I want you to control my motives because I was bought at a price and I'm going to glorify God with my body and my spirit because both belong to him and those are the motivators of my life. And if I say, Lord, you control me, I'm going to say control my thoughts. Do you know what 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 says? It says bringing every thought captive. When Bonnie and I used to live in, uh, we started out after uh, MacArthur's went to the East Coast and I pastored a church out there and we lived actually on the water of the Atlantic Ocean. And every time there was a hurricane or something, they would say, oh, everything, tie it down. And if you have a boat, bring it in, you know, it's gonna be a bad one. And of course we didn't have a boat nor anything to tie down. It was lucky we had a house. And I remember in 92, hurricane, I don't remember which one, one of the boys came through and we left because, you know, uh, you were supposed to get away from the coast. And when we came back, I mean, it was very hard. We were driving around trees down, power lines all twisted. We finally turned the corner and saw our house. There was a white picket fence in front of it and a 42 foot long yacht with three masts leaning against our fence and the top of their, the mass of the sailboat mass were almost touching our front window. And I thought, thank you, Lord. I've always wanted a big boat, you know. Uh, you brought me one, you know. But actually, they came and hauled it away. And, and I wondered, how did that thing get there? You know, it just, we were 500 feet from the water and that's how far the storm surge went. And you see, I've got your minds all, all over the place, haven't I? Do you know what this verse says? We, this is what life is like. We are thinking about one thing, we all of a sudden are over here. Do you know what this says? Bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Just like that boat wasn't tied down, it got in my front yard and they took it away, sadly. 
our thoughts are to be brought captive. And when we say control me, we're saying control my treasures, control my body, control my thoughts, control my life, control my emotions. We'll look at that. Control my time, control my mind. Only let in true, honest, just, pure. Only let me love things that you love. Whoop, back up. Come on. There. When I pray the Lord's Prayer and focus on God, my first petition is, now God, control my treasures. Don't let me live for what I can't take with me. Send it ahead. Control my body. Remind me that my body's not in control. You are my motives for life. Lasso my thoughts. Bring them into captivity. Let me live that crucified life. I want the fruit of the spirits, you controlling my emotions. I want you to help me redeem my time. I only want to think about what's true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and good report. I want to have my speech seasoned with salt, having grace all over it. And I want to only love what you want me to love. And that's what the Lord's Prayer, just one element of it, is all about in our lives. Let's all stand. And as we stand, I remind you of two things. One, Ken Weiss, that you just heard, uh, interviewed at the front of the service is back tonight and I was telling someone in first service he is truly a gifted teacher of God's word and to hear him communicate the word uh, is a real treat and I'm looking forward to it. Number two, at the end of every service there are connection specialists here that know how to help you be connected to God and if you feel far away from him don't leave. Come up to one of those men or women and say would you pray with me? Would you help me? I'm not sure I'm connected. I'm not sure I have what he's talking about. And if I have it, it's not working. Or I just have a burden and I want to share it. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, as we bow, we focus on who we're talking to. Focus me and each of us, I pray, that you are all powerful, Father in heaven. And then we invite your control. You certainly can live my life better than I ever could and you will if I'll just invite you to do so and I pray that we would go through the rest of today and as long as you give us to live doing a little checklist making sure we focus on who we're talking to and first thing invite your control of our lives and we pray this in the precious name of Jesus and for his glory and all God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.